You are listening to The Interactome, a podcast by a group of young researchers who want to connect you to the world of science by sharing their stories and perspectives. Just in case their bosses are listening, they want to remind you that the opinions expressed here are their own. They also want to remind you not to take anything they say as medical or professional advice, as they are not doctors. Not yet, anyway. Stay tuned about that. And without further ado, welcome to the Interactome. Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Interactome. We're excited to have you here with us today as we have our first special guest on the podcast. Back in March 2020, as the COVID pandemic was just taking hold here in Boston and the rest of the U.S., there was a nationwide shortage of testing swabs. Today, we'll be talking with Dr. Rami Arnault about his experience leading an effort to resolve the shortage by 3D printing the swabs and the lessons learned along the way. His reflections are also detailed in an article in the Journal of Clinical Microbiology, which we'll link below. He's also my former PI, and I'm super excited for you all to hear the story. So, Rami, would you like to take it away? Sure. Shall I start with an introduction? Yeah, absolutely. Tell the people who you are. Sure. I am uh, Dr. Rami Arnault. I am the Associate Director of Clinical Microbiology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, which is a tertiary healthcare center located here at the hub of the universe, Boston, Massachusetts. We're about a 585 bed center. And uh, what else do you need to know about me? I guess how I got to be where I'm at. Yeah, I'm very curious about that. All right, let's see. Maybe uh, maybe I'll give you, uh, the, the people always say, don't give me your life story. So you got to you gotta tell me if that's what you want. <laughs> sure. If you want to, you can give the full version, the abbreviated version, as it relates to this project that you have. Sure. Well, maybe I'll try the abbreviated version. So I'm a Boston native, uh, born and bred, uh, went to MIT, got very interested in science as well as a bunch of other things, a lot of mathematics and engineering in there too. Went off and got a PhD quite by accident in something called mathematical biology, probably more familiar today to people as systems biology or computational biology. And that gave me even more of the quantitative bug. Uh, so that I nurtured, uh, I nurtured that through medical school, which I did back uh, in town here at Harvard, and have been a clinical pathologist ever since. And for those of you who don't know, pathology is a diagnostic specialty where we look especially at tissue that can be blood or, uh, or organs. And clinical pathology is really the art of the blood test. And within clinical pathology, one of the things we look at is whether people are infected or not. And to figure that out, we have to do microbiology. And so that is what I am. I'm a clinical microbiologist. I also run a research lab where, in, where I'm especially interested in the immune response to infections, but also other things like cancer, autoimmunity, and aging. And we do a lot of sequencing as part of that. But what has to do with the, like the background, I guess it's relevant for uh, today is that uh, as part of my research, I had done some work on cooperation. Uh, we can talk more about that. I think it'll come up. And then otherwise, <clears throat> I was one of three directors of clinical microbiology at the institution right when the pandemic hit. And we were charged with uh, keeping the hospital above water. We were not the only people who faced this, obviously, around the country. Everybody was doing the same but it kind of fell to us to figure out three things, how to get testing up and running, how to get the fluid that we use in order to transport testing materials from patients where they get tested to the lab where we actually do the testing. And what fell especially to me was to figure out how we were gonna get swabs in order to, uh, to do that testing. So to back up just a second, when a person gets tested, actually, what am I talking about? It's two years into the pandemic, probably everybody has been tested. Um, but for anybody who's lucky enough not to, or uh, for those of you who have tried so hard to forget, standard testing, the state-of-the-art testing for SARS coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2, the causative agent of COVID-19, is to stick a nasopharyngeal swab 
really deep up one's nose, all the way to the back of all the way to the back of the nose. Uh, they call it a brain tick, like a you know six inch swab. Yeah, I remember seeing the photos of that for the first time like a year ago, and I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, so yeah, so they're they're not a they're not a joke. They're like six inches six inches long. You can't stick them in yourself because they go too far back. So you need trained personnel to do it. But the uh, uh, the advantage is they're the best uh, for getting viral samples for respiratory infections and uh, try to paint a picture here. So six inches long, the tip is a little bit more bulbous. It's about an inch long and it is covered with little filaments that are known as flock and that increases the surface area. You can imagine as like a tiny, almost like a really microscopic kind of pipe cleaner type appearance. Uh, okay. at the tip of a, of a of a very long thin straw i don't i don't know if i'm painting that picture well or not but yeah so long flexible stock with a, a slightly larger diameter bulb at the end of it that's covered with this flock material to uh, that you twirl around or that a healthcare professional twirls around at the back of your throat which picks up nasal secretions out of your nose it comes into a tube it goes that tube's got the fluid that i mentioned before and then that tube with the fluid and the swab inside gets capped and gets sent to a lab for testing. So I'll start by asking you, um, first of all, I want to plug your article that you have in ASM, um, which if you haven't read it already, please go and read it. It's a fantastic reflection on um, really the story that we're talking about today and about the lessons learned, especially cooperation in a very short amount of time. Um, so. Dr. Arnaud, are you able to elaborate more on how you stumbled into this? I know you said you were kind of put in charge of this whole thing, but how did that come to be? And was that a role that was given very quickly? Um, and if you can also give a little bit of background on the previous cooperation work you've done in the past, I think that would be helpful too. Sure. Let me take those in order. So rewind back to the start of March 2020. I had been on service for two weeks because coincidentally, everybody else was out sick with really bad colds. It turned out none of that was COVID, but it was first one of my fellow directors and then the other, and then both of our fellows all out sick. And so I was doing everything I could to kind of keep things uh, moving along. As COVID was starting to look more and more serious, I had a conversation with uh, my immediate boss, uh, Director of Clinical Microbiology, James Kirby, asking him how he thought we should prioritize. And he said, well, you know, we've, we've got these three needs. We need to get a test up and running, which we didn't have. We need, and we need to make sure we can collect specimens for that test, which we couldn't do. And collecting specimens required a fluid and required a swab. And we pretty much drew straws and there were three of us. And so, uh, you know, three people for three jobs and swabs fell to me. And that's how we got started. So it's, it's interesting. Cooperation keeps, keeps coming back into my life in unexpected ways. So uh, I mentioned I did a PhD in mathematical biology. My PhD, like the topic of my thesis, was anti, uh, antiviral immune dynamics inside a person. Uh, I don't have to go into that too much, but it's, you know, imagine like foxes and rabbits. And instead of foxes and like, you know, foxes eat rabbits and rabbits divide or ra rabbits uh, reproduce. But instead of foxes and rabbits, you had immune cells and virus infected cells. So that was kind of the idea. And there was a lot of math and it was a lot of fun. But that wasn't the only thing that the lab that I had joined did. The other big thing that they did, arguably what they were better known for, was uh, mathematical models of cooperation. And these ideas I find uh, so fascinating that uh, I, I, I really think everybody else will should, should know about them too if they don't already. Uh, the modern history of this field starts with a, a professor named Robert Axelrod in Michigan, who at the height of the Cold War, when the Soviet Union was an existential threat to the United States and the United States was perceived as an existential threat to the Soviet Union and you know nobody was big enough to tell each of these, either of these guys what to do, the question arose among political scientists uh, as a theoretical question, well, if there's no 
central authority that is strong enough to make others cooperate, then is there ever any hope for those players to cooperate? In other words, without a central authority, without you know God or aliens or, or something coming down and making the United States and the Soviet Union uh, behave, uh, which I think, by the way, was a plot of one of the sequels to 2001, uh, Space Odyssey. The, the aliens basically kind of like kind of whip us into shape, I think. Maybe not directly, but that was the implication. But the question was, without uh, without Arthur C. Clarke writing uh, science fiction that comes true, what was going to make the United States and the Soviet Union cooperate? And the... Uh, and this fellow Axelrod said, well, you know, I, I, I don't, I've got ideas, but I don't necessarily know the answer. Let me ask everybody. Let me ask luminaries. And so he asked other political scientists, but he also asked economists and theologians and mathematicians. And the way that he wanted to get an answer is he figured he'd use these newfangled things called personal computers, and he would build a competition inside the computer where he would have agents, little little uh, computer sort of avatars of the United States and Soviet Union, and he would have them play a simple game where they could either cooperate with each other or not, and not cooperating is called defecting. And if they cooperate, they both do well, but if one cooperates and the other defects, well, then the defector kind of suckers the cooperator. The cooperator is kind of like, sure, I'll help you, and then the defector is like, ah, oh, sucker, and it's literally called suckering and they get what's called the temptation payoff. So these cooperate, defect, sucker, temptation, these are all terms of art. So you might imagine that if there's the risk of being defected on, why would anyone ever cooperate? And so you're, if you're one of these avatars, you'd say, oh, well, I'm gonna defect just like the other guy is expected to, but then you both defect and you both don't do very well. So the idea is you both do better if you cooperate than if you both defect, but one of you does way better than the other, way better than cooperating if that person defects on a cooperator. And so Axelrod basically said, I want you all to give me your strategies and I'm gonna play this game between these avatars over and over again and we'll see what strategy makes sense. And people came up with strategies like, oh, well, I'm gonna start by cooperating, but then if I think the other guy's gonna defect, then I might defect too, unless I've seen him cooperate twice in a row, in which case I might defect because he's probably gonna cooperate again, unless he cooperates three times in a row, in which case I'm certainly gonna cooperate with him. And these things got arbitrarily complicated and he put these all in a computer and he had them compete to see what strategy did the best. And it was a shock to almost everybody that what did the best was something uh, called uh, tit for tat, which basically says start out cooperating and in the next round, do whatever was done to you last round. And this outperformed everything else. And this, uh, you know, became a, a this, this observation led to a lot of, uh, a lot of mathematical interest saying, well, wait a minute, how, how, can that, how can that work? And, you know, is this a way out of the Cold War? Of course, the Cold War ended before any of that could really come to pass. But the ideas are still out there. How do you get folks to cooperate? And, uh, um, you know, some important lessons that come out of that is, uh, uh, are that first, there is this temptation to defect. If everyone is, is cooperating, it's really tempting for somebody to come in and just kind of skim off the success but not contribute anything. And that, that can be called a tragedy of the commons. Um, but the way that you... Uh, get people to cooperate uh, according to that theory, like the theory that came out of that work and uh, in subsequent work, include that you uh, make very clear what the goals are and you try to establish social norms that defection will just not be tolerated. Like, you know, we're, we're all playing here and we all, we all brought something to the potluck, but if you don't, you just aren't eating. And so mm -hmm. that, that's kind of an, an important part of it. So I said this keeps coming back, this, this you know, idea of cooperation and, and uh, cooperation, especially among people who might not know each other and might not know enough to you know, like not have a lot to go on. So the second time this came back uh, to me was many years after where I had a complicated computational problem in my lab and had spent a good long time coding a solution that was pretty fast and did pretty well, but you know, took me a lot of work. And I could see going forward with the kind of computational research that I do, 
that there were going to be a lot of problems like this. And if it was going to require individuals to spend all their time coding, well, you know, progress was going to be slow. Was there a better way? And it so happened, I was describing this problem over coffee with a fellow from Harvard Business School, a professor over there, uh, who said, you know, he was interested in getting strangers to cooperate in sort of a crowdsource type way. And they were looking for exactly problems like this in order to test a couple of theories about what does best. And I said, well, look, you can have this problem because I know how hard it was to do and I can tell you exactly how good it does. And let's see how much better we might be able to get it through a sort of crowdsourced cooperation. And the way the experiment was set up was as follows. So the question they had there was this. They said, is it better? Does it, does it lead to better code, to better performing uh, computer programs? If you have everybody just work by themselves without cooperating and just submit what they've got. In other words, make a put out a public call saying, hey, Natalie, Sarah, Maya, I want everybody to write a computer program that that handles this problem. And then you all submit it. And because you all know that you want to you want to be the best and you want to do the best, that's certain to surface the best, the best answer. So that was hypothesis one. Hypothesis two was no, 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 that that doesn't work at all. Everybody should definitely go off by themselves and work on their own ideas, but only for a little while. And then once they've kind of sketched out saying, you know, I want to look at it this way. No, no, I have a better idea. I'm going to go at it that way. Once everybody's got their own ideas, they should make all those ideas public, share with each other. And then every, that gives everybody a chance to look at each other's ideas and said, oh, well, you really got something there. And if I combine that with what we've got here, that'll work. And then a third person comes along and says, oh, oh that, that's perfect because I'd thought that something like that could be doable, but I couldn't figure out how to get that part of it done. But once that part of it's done, I can make that whole thing go way faster. And then the third hypothesis uh, was that, nah, just everybody tell everybody what everybody else is doing straight off the bat. And the money was on number two. Nobody thought that everybody working by themselves was going to go the furthest. And I think it's fair to say, well, at least I certainly didn't think that everybody making everything public off the bat would work because everybody would just kind of glom on to one idea and you'd kind of have a tunnel vision and you'd lose some good ideas. Therefore, we were all quite surprised to see that the second option, uh, excuse me, that the third option, the third option where everybody shared everything off the bat blew the other two out of the water. It was it was it was really something, and that was work that ended up getting uh, published, uh, and uh, to to some acclaim, I think, in Nature Biotechnology several years ago. But the lesson stayed with me about uh, making everything public in order to move fast. So this is all a really long way of answering your question about well, you know, how how did co what did cooperation have to do with with the swab crisis? I bet we're all thinking like, why didn't we make everything publicly available to begin with? This sounds a lot easier. <laughs> it was it was the secret. It was the answer. Uh, and maybe just to set the scene a little bit more, I might have uh, might have jumped a step by on that day uh, in the beginning of March when the three of us directors had decided, you know, we'd drawn straws and decided, okay, you know, I was going to end up doing um, swabs. You know, step number one: uh, figure out what the how big the problem is so that you know what you're up against and the problem was we had about a week left of swabs the pandemic was just gearing up there was no way that we were going to be able to do tests if we didn't if we didn't get more so this was this was a real problem it turned out that the two big swab manufacturers uh, were just completely overmatched one of them happened to be in italy a company called copan and they were, they had added extra shifts. They were, you know, hitting, getting the brunt of the pandemic before we were, there was no help coming from Copan. You couldn't get a co you couldn't buy a Copan swab. China was completely offline and nobody knew for how long. And then a company just north of us here in New England, Puritan in Maine, uh, were, uh, well, what they told me was that they were requisitioned by the government. And so we couldn't get any swabs from them. Uh, Maybe uh, interestingly, the government subsequently told me they had no idea what Puritan was talking about. But it's uh, there's just kind of a lot of confusion like that in the pandemic. So you know we were we were out, 
So getting back to cooperation, making making everything public. Well, one thing is to make what you learn public, but the other is the other lesson from uh, from the paper we had is you got to know when you need help. Man's got to know his limitations, and we needed help. And so the first thing that we did is we put out a call to everyone. Uh, we went up and down the chain. We had help from the CEO of the organization and everybody uh, in between, saying, "Look, you know, we need to test, and we don't have testing swabs." Everybody, whatever you do, whatever specialty you've got, if you've got a drawer somewhere in some outpatient clinic in Boston, open that drawer and see if you've got any swabs that even remotely fit the following spec. You know, things such as long, bulbous head, flock. If you've got a puritaner copan swab, wonderful. If it's a flocked swab, great. But, uh, you know, just, just anything. And so that Sorry was... Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I'm actually curious. Was this issue across, I'm assuming this wasn't solely at BI. I'm sure this was at other hospitals in Boston as well. This was a worldwide problem. This was certainly true at uh, not just at BI, but at the other hospitals in our network. It was true at other hospitals uh, in Boston, it, but it was true across the country. And it rapidly uh, dawned on us, I don't think actually it was, it was any secret from the start, that the problem that we were having was a problem that everybody was having. And so we had kept it in those first you know, couple of days we had in the back of our minds is like, well, if we solve this problem, uh, that that's not going to do any good for the pandemic unless others can solve it too. So from day one, it was clear to us that we were going to want to share everything that we learned uh, on how to solve this problem. And similarly, we were going to open an invitation to everybody else saying, look, you know, no egos here. If you have solved this problem, please share. So, uh, you know, scrounging was, was one thing that we, uh, one, one strategy that we followed, the first and most obvious. The second was repurposing. Swabs, there are a lot of different kinds of swabs used in medicine. Think of every, I don't want to get too graphic here, think of every, every possible utility, every anatomic orifice, you know, there's, there's a swab that, that covers it for some reason, for some diagnostic uh, purpose. And, uh, you know, we didn't know what other swabs were used uh, for, for other things. And we thought, well, maybe some of them could repurposed, be repurposed. There are, I think, pictures still up on a website that we put up to share all of this uh, data. If you Google COVID swab on GitHub, uh, you, will, you will find it. It's public and, uh, uh, you know, well, obviously it's public for, for all of these reasons. And, uh, you know, as you look through some of the swabs that we received for evaluation, I'm getting ahead of myself a bit, but we'll get to it in a second. Uh, you will appreciate that there are a lot of these swabs are not going up anybody's nose. That's just, just not, not going to happen. Uh, but the, so, you know, scrounging was one thing, repurposing was a second thing, but you know, when you're, when you're in a crisis like that, you don't know what's going to work. So you don't put all your eggs in one basket. You put, you put your eggs in as many baskets as, as you, as you can get and you get your friends to help you. So you get more, both more eggs and more baskets. And so that was, uh, that was something I did because in addition to scrounging and repurposing, I thought, well, look, it may be that we have to simply manufacture swabs. And you may be saying, wait a minute. I mean, you said there's like big multinational companies that do this. And these are sure there, there's a simplicity to swabs, but there's a lot of work that goes into swabs in order to design them to be that simple. What materials are they biologically safe? What is this flock, this material that goes on the tip? How does it go on there? Is that glue? Is that glue okay? How much of it goes on? What about the stock? How flexible can it be? They design a break point about a third of the way along the stock so that when you take the swab out of the person's nose, you can break it off nicely into the tube that goes to the hospital. I mean, it's a lot of, a lot of hard work went into making swabs look so simple. And we were aware of that. And so we figured if we had to manufacture these things, we were going to have to do a fair bit of reverse engineering. And every part of that process was a question that needs to be answered. I mean, I'd, I'd worked on a startup several years before. And one of the fun things, if your personality, uh, if your personality finds this kind of thing fun, is that there's a million things to do. And when you don't know whose job it is to do a particular thing, the answer is probably you. You're usually sitting in a sitting at a table, and often with pizza or something, with like two or three of your friends, and you say, "Okay, here are the twelve things we have to do." 
And it's not like, oh, well, you know, we need an HR department to do that one and we need procurement for this and we need accounts receivable for that. And we need, nope, you, the people around the table are the people who have to get that done. And so you divvy it up and you get it done. And kind of the same thing here. It's just like, uh, I don't know if any of you know, there's a, 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 a kind of a, a comic with a dartboard on it that's got just the names of different professions. And there's a person standing there with a dart and at the top of the dartboard, it says, today I am a... And then it's got <laughs> titles of things like today I am a, a you know, uh, uh, a, a swab manufacturing expert was where the dart <laughs> landed on. And so that that was the way we looked at it. Yeah, I thought it was so surprising just like thinking about swabs. I had never thought about swabs in much detail before or like all the different considerations that they need to have to be like the perfect swab. So it does indeed sound like a lot of work. Um, yeah, and I did have a quick question for you. Um, so I know you discussed um, about how making things publicly available and getting all sorts of ideas from a diverse, a diverse group of people um, has proven to be like really beneficial um, and successful. Um, but I also know that some people say that working in smaller groups is easier to manage. So I was wondering how in your, in your team went around kind of like sifting through all the ideas um, in order to combat the swab shortage? Because um, it sounds like there was a lot of things pouring in um, in every direction. So uh, that's a great question. Uh, large teams can be unwieldy, small teams can move fast, but have limited throughput. It so happened that the size of the group that ended up nucleating around this problem uh, in, in a couple of ways was sort of the, the perfect size for a bunch of the parts of this uh, a bunch of the parts of this this undertaking and i don't know maybe it's a bit evolutionary right like you add more people because you need them and then when you have enough you've you've got enough uh so two examples so the the first thing i did when i thought oh you know we have to manufacture these things was realize well you know i'm i'm, I'm i may be a bunch of things right i'm a computational immunologist i'm a clinical microbiologist i am not a swab manufacturer who is and so I reached out to some friends of mine who were engineers that I knew from my undergrad days at MIT. They, they make engineers there. It's, a, um, it's kind of their thing. None of the people were swab scientists in any way, but they were you know, good, good people to have around you in a crisis. And uh, you know, before you knew it, there were five or six of us, I guess. Uh, uh, I guess, yep, yeah, six including me. Uh, so nobody was a swab expert. Uh, nobody, none of the others had uh, medical training. Nobody, and this is, I think, important, uh, certainly at the time, nobody had any desire for any kind of recognition or uh, recognition, whether it be uh, kind of academic or professional or, or economic or anything like that. There were just people who wanted to help. So, uh, you know, one of them was uh, an advisor, I, I believe I, I could be wrong about this, but it was an advisor, an engineering consultant to Google. Two of them worked at, in essentially maker spaces uh, at Harvard Medical School. Uh, one of them ran it. Two other people, one was uh, an engineer, an entrepreneur, and the, the last one was an engineer who was working for, gosh, I want to say well, one of the big companies out in Washington state. So nobody with any special expertise, but just really good thinkers, really good people in a crisis. And uh, we started, you know, basically, you know, called, called up a couple of those people and, you know, one phone call connected to another. And, you know, by, I guess it might've been even day two, we were having these calls a couple of times a day saying, okay, so how do we do this? And what they wanted to know from me was, well, you know, what exactly is the spec that, what are the specifications for a swab? And what I wanted to know from them is, well, you know, how does one manufacture these things and where can we go to get manufacturing capacity? What manufacturing capacity is around? Of the many different ways you could imagine to end up with a swab, what were the best ones? Um, you know, very briefly, there's uh, something called injection molding, where you make a big, usually metal uh, negative, a mold uh, of, uh, of, 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 of a swab and you inject plastic into it and the plastic cools in the shape of a swab and then you open up the mold and out, out falls your swab. And that's, um, that's, the way to, to, that's the way that most swabs are made. 
then they're usually dipped in uh, a glue and flock goes on and then dipped into flock and then and then that's that's kind of it so injection molding uh, is one way um, additive manufacture is another so like 3d printing um, you can't easily 3d print flock although uh, the covid crisis was a great opportunity for uh, one person who i met who was working on doing exactly that kind of thing for totally different reasons to uh, kind of like cut his teeth on figuring out how to get his company to do that. And I think they were, um, uh, they learned quite a lot during, uh, during the COVID crisis for, for that purpose. So in the spirit of cooperation, you might be wondering, well, you know, so weren't we able to just, why didn't we just ask Puritan and Copan for how they do it so that we could more easily reverse engineer and just copy what they were doing? Certainly, uh, you know, we all wanted to team up uh, if in the face of this global pandemic, right? I mean, they can't make things, but maybe they can let us make things. This is a cautionary tale for when cooperation, uh, for it's sort of like proving cooperation in the breach, the exception that proves a rule. So when I asked Puritan for that information, I got a polite, oh, we'll get back to you, followed by a legal threat and cease and desist order uh, from their lawyers by email. Ooh. Oh, wow. And I was uh, a little bit bemused. I was like, I don't, I don't know what's going on in Maine, but you know, down here in Massachusetts and the rest of Earth, we've got a global pandemic. It sounds like they didn't want to cooperate. And what I learned after that, you're 100% right. What I learned after that is apparently, and now this is hearsay, but Apparently, Copen and Puritan have been trading lawsuits forever about each one infringing on the other's swab designs. So this is apparently a very litigious area that we just happen to wander into. Uh, what we decided is, you know what, if you want to sue us, you, you're welcome to sue anybody who's still alive at the end of this. But meanwhile, we're going to get testing started. And so we decided not to care about infringement of any sort. We knew we weren't going to get any help from them but we were just going to, to reverse engineer as best we could. And what emerged from those first conversations pretty clearly was that the only way that we were going to be able to develop uh, and manufacture swabs on the urgent timescale that we needed them was going to be 3D printing because injection molding is expensive and it is slow and you iterate very slowly. Basically, once you've got a good design, you can invest in building this metal block that is the negative of your swab. Until, uh, until you do though, you know, build, building those things is slow and very expensive. Whereas 3D printing, you know, you can mock up, uh, excuse me, you can, you can mock up a design in a CAD program and print it, you know, pretty much a minute later. And if you don't like it, you can tweak and can iterate on the design and you can do it again. Uh, 3D printing is more expensive still on a per on a per item uh, basis than an injection molded product of of um, of the kind that swabs are, but there's just no beating it for quick iteration and for speed, and there's also no beating it for the unbelievable variety of different kinds of structures you can 3D print that you just can't do by injection molding. Uh, and so that really opened up quite a lot of innovation, some innovative new uh, swab head types. So instead of having a swab head with flock all around it, uh, some of the designs that, uh, that we later validated were essentially honeycomb on the outside, but empty on the inside, such that they end up collecting a lot of the secretions that we end up doing testing on inside them. And that was, that was quite novel. I do have a question for you. I'm going to play devil's advocate slightly here. I think the timeline, I mean, I think it's fair to say everyone's going to agree on this. The timeline for you accomplishing all of this, especially with the resources that you had and the two or three weeks that you really were able to get it done is very impressive. What is your stance on luck? Do you believe luck came into play at all in this? Or do you think it was mainly a matter of hard work? Or was it more of an engineered look, which is more of a mix? Kind of curious to hear your stance on, on you know, because a critic could say, oh, okay, well, he was just well-connected. So uh, I, I like the term engineered luck. And I, I'm trying to remember the, um, the, the aphorism. I think it's uh, luck favors the prepared. 
So look, certainly there was an element of luck here. And I can, in fact, enumerate, uh, you know, the, the, the parts of that element. So the first was that I was lucky enough to know uh, really amazing people, uh, both from my undergraduate days at MIT and also that they also knew other people. So I knew some people from MIT, I knew some people from Harvard. And yeah, you can say that that's luck, right? If I hadn't gone to MIT, if I didn't have sort of a, you know, a, kind of a, 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 a secret uh, kind of maker uh, desire, then I wouldn't have encountered um, those folks. And they were super helpful because even as we were discussing, as we were saying, okay, well, injection molding, or we could make them individually, or we could 3D print them, you know, already on that call, somebody said, oh, well, I know a 3D, I know somebody at a 3D printer company. And then when I said, well, if, if we know one of them, then maybe we know more. Can you talk to them and tell them like, who, who are the other people in this space? And then I realized that I knew a couple of people and it was not, uh, I didn't know 3D printer manufacturers uh, directly, but when I also started looking through my network and I was literally calling everybody I knew, especially entrepreneurs. And I was like, hey, do you know anybody who's got this kind of capacity? And uh, you know, I, I just said, Anybody who knows anybody that could even be remotely useful, feels it could even be remotely useful in having any 3D printer capacity, email me, call me. Here's my number. Here's the website. My contact information is up there. I'm available 24 seven. And I had some people saying, oh, well, you know, I've got some friends who have 20 3D printers that they use um, for a camp for K through eight that they bring kids in to see what they can make. Would that be useful? And I said, you know, at this point, sure, please connect me with them. But what ended up working was navigating, not just me navigating my network, but asking people in my network to navigate theirs is what brought us to the, to the right people. So uh, luck versus, I guess the opposite of luck is skill maybe, but uh, look, there are a lot of things that, that go in one's favor if one searches. So I'm going to nerd out here for a second uh, using again, but go for it, nerd out. <laughs> awesome. so the, the kind of things that, uh, you know, that I've gotten interested, uh, through my, through my research career. So, uh, think, so, so what we've, what we've learned over the last 20, 25 years or so about complex networks is they often are very heterogeneous, meaning there are some, so what is a network? A network is like a node, say a person, you know, and uh, a set of edges and edges connect those nodes. So an edge is like when somebody knows somebody else. And so uh, like a social network is an example of a network. And that's the kind of network we're talking about here. But what I'm saying holds for many, many types of networks, both in the natural and built worlds. So uh, some nodes have a lot of edges, meaning some people know a lot of people. And, but the, the, the majority of nodes have few edges in a lot of real world net, real real world networks meaning you know uh you know your most of your friends know a couple of people but one of your friends just kind of seems to know everybody the one feature of those kinds of networks is if you start traversing them so uh you just you know common things being common uh any individual person is unlikely to be that guy who knows everybody they're more likely to be one of the people who knows a few people. But if you start traversing your network, if you start talking to your friends and telling your friends to talk to their friends, in short order, you arrive at one of those people who knows everybody because they know everybody. If they don't know you, then they, they probably know somebody that you talk to. And- uh, Do you know and, if there's, huh? sorry to interrupt, do you know if there's like a certain number of tries it takes to get to that person? Like, is it usually the third person you reach or is it the fifth? I don't know if there's a number or statistic on that. Yeah. So this is like the six degrees of Kevin Bacon uh, type. Yeah. I was just thinking that. <laughs> and for, for those who might not know, the idea here is that uh, this is kind of like a, a usually a common college game, or at least it used to be, where uh, you name uh, an actor and you, uh, you see if you can draw a chain, draw a connection back to Kevin Bacon, who's you know an actor getting on in years now, but he's been in a lot of movies with a lot of other actors. And so you would say, some, somebody would say something like, like, um, like, like Franco. And it's like, oh, well, Franco was in Planet of the Apes with John Lithgow, who was the principal or the minister, I guess, 
in Footloose with Kevin Bacon, bam. So it's like two connections. So that's kind of how, how that works. And the, uh, the reason six degrees of Kevin Bacon, you know, kind of like a, a, a takeoff on three to six degrees of separation is that in, in the movie and the acting world, everybody is within six degrees of Kevin Bacon. And I think the actual number is closer to four and change, I think on average. And that's called the diameter of the network. It's kind of like, or it's related, I should say, to the idea of the diameter of the network is like, what is the shortest path from any point to any other point? So Sarah, you're asking, is there a number and is it three? Uh, one thing that, that you learn when you study these networks is every network is slightly different, but the radius is usually, or the, excuse me, the diameter is usually pretty small. So three, five, something like that. Um, but of course you gotta go in the right direction. I mean, if you were kind of willfully uh, trying not to solve your problem, you can always talk to the wrong person. This is a little bit like when you get on the phone with you know some kind of customer support and they send you from one person to another person to another person. And you're like, look, I could have been talking to the CEO by now if that chain had gone in the right direction, but it did not. So you do have to make sure that as you as you pursue, as you as you traverse that network, that you're being a little bit selective. The right person is near. You just have to go in the right direction. So luck versus skill, engineered luck. I like that term. So we we try to engineer our luck a little bit. Um, and then uh, back my to your question about like you know the the right size. These five people plus me seem to be the right size to traverse the network. So that was kind of our Lewis and Clark scouting party. It was like Lewis <laughs> and Clark, but it was really Jenny and, and Karen and Affair and Pavel and Gotham and me. Uh, but then when we started actually getting in touch with Sarah, those those nodes, those, you know, the the, the, the CEOs of 3D printing companies, uh, then and, and started getting people sending us their best efforts as uh, at swabs according to the specification that we'd put up online on, on GitHub and told everybody and pointed everybody to, uh, then we needed another small group, a uh, small army, I guess, in order to test these swabs. And again, that ended up being about, well, in that case, like five to 10 people, depending on how you counted it. Not everybody was involved in every step. Overall, there were hundreds of people involved uh, across the country, probably closer to a thousand but small groups here and there doing their small group things. There's a small group at HP that was making the HP swap. There was a small group at Envision Tech making the Envision Tech swap. There was a small group uh, here at BI testing. There was a small group also at BI that was helping us with the autoclave testing. There was obviously our small group that was traversing the network. So a bunch of small groups, it was very clumpy. It was never sort of a large auditorium filled with people. Dr. Arno, I was also curious um, about whether or not you think that this level of cooperation you've experienced with your team and all the small groups that you've mentioned, um, I was wondering, do you think this level of cooperation is only possible in crisis conditions like we had in the early days of the pandemic, or do you think something like this is possible kind of like in our everyday lives? That is maybe the question that, that comes out of this whole swab experience. I'm gonna take the optimist view for a second and say that the COVID experience proves that this kind of cooperation can happen at any time. Because if it was able to happen when nobody was able to get to work and everybody was getting sick and worried and and uh, just everything was was, uh, was topsy-turvy, then surely, the, the optimistic view goes, surely when everything is settled down and we know what we needed to do because we've, we've done it, like we did it, we know it works, uh, then we can institute uh, that kind of cooperation all the time. So uh, what do you have to do in order to make that happen? And this is where you got to have to uh, kind of watch out for the kinds of things that have kept this sort of thing from happening as a matter of course, because they, they don't happen as a matter of course. So um, going back to this paradigm of cooperation versus defection, one of the things that you see in a crisis is that because you don't know how things are gonna pan out and because everything is sort of new, I mean, we're inventing, you know, nasopharyngeal, we're, we're inventing an FDA exempt medical device from scratch, right? We did that four times in, in three weeks. 
uh, you, uh, it's, it's unclear what the payoff is going to be. It's unclear if it's going to work. And because it's unclear if it's going to work, it's unclear how valuable defection would be. It's unclear. Does it make sense to sit back and say, oh, if I sit back and wait for these guys working 24-7, 365 or 24-7, 21, I guess, to, to solve the problem, I can then swoop in and somehow claim credit or capitalize off it in some way. There's, there's not really that much of an incentive to do that because you, you don't have any idea it's going to work, right? Once things have worked, once you're out of a crisis and things, you see things have worked, then suddenly there's a bit more of an incentive for defection, maybe kind of you know, counterintuitively, because people are like, oh, that kind of thing is possible. I don't have to help with that. They'll, they'll get it done. But if I position, while well, they're all busy building, if I'm positioning myself with the press to get the credit, or if I'm busy calling up editors at journals saying that, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be able to publish this thing. I'm just going to kind of skim off of their hard work and I'm going to do that in a hurry and not tell anybody. Or, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to secretly get a contract with this hospital to buy millions of my swabs and, and make a killing. You know, there's, there's, now that there's a, there's a there there, there's a temptation for, for defection. So in that sense, it's less about the crisis making cooperation successful in this particular case and more about just not knowing what would work or not. So if you, I think if people knew it would work, then it would have been harder to do, which is maybe counterintuitive. And early by the end of it, as it was clear, as you know, as our first couple of, of swabs were passing clinical validation and started to started to get used, you could already feel that happening. You know, you, you would hear about back channels, about people trying to finagle contracts or trying to slip a paper in to some journal. Like you started hearing that stuff at the end. So you could kind of feel that happening. But going back to the to the optimist view, there were a number of things that we learned that give us a pretty clear roadmap for how to make this kind of uh, this kind of cooperative success uh, happen more easily, and uh, you know a lot of it goes back to just social norms and, and supporting social norms, um, but a lot of it is also uh, the grunt work on the back end that uh, that is usually the kind of thing that ties up projects in a lot of red tape. And that was all preemptively cut for us by extraordinary yeoman's work throughout the administration at our hospital. Um, it is all not the usual process at our hospital. Indeed, it is not the usual process anywhere, but it does give us all a lesson that, for example, if the best people for the job are the ones helping that part of the job, everything goes faster. You know, we needed to handle potential issues of ownership, or as I, as I insisted, absolute lack of ownership of any of the designs that we would come up with. Well, who's responsible for that at an institution? It's usually a technology transfer office or a technology ventures office. We preemptively spoke with our office and our office, whose job in normal days it is to extract every penny they can for the institution from the kind of intellectual effort that we were, that we were doing, they basically said, nope, you have our blessing. Nobody's going to own this stuff. Because if we wait for somebody to own this stuff, A, it's going to be a fight, B, it's going to take forever. And in the very real world, that means people don't get tested, people spread the illness, people die. So instead of saying, all right, we'll have a conversation, we'll schedule a meeting, you know, maybe a couple of weeks and we'll make sure the right, nope, went straight to the head, the head, actually the, the, the top three people all basically were instantly available to me and they instantly said, don't worry about it taken care of. And I said, okay, what waiver or form or paper? They said, we will handle that paperwork. We'll send it to you for your signature. Give it a read and sign it. Wonderful. What we were doing is clinical trials. Clinical trials require institutional review board authorization. Extremely important. Don't ever do anything without IRB approval. Long history that supports that um, for, for a million reasons that we don't have time to go into. But when you write an IRB, 
in addition to you know, sort of wanting to do it and wanting to do it right, there's just a lot of paperwork and it's never quite obvious. Well, do I fill this out this way or that way? Do I like what, what, when should, when should I, uh, when should I submit this to this person for approval or just to the whole board for approval? And I immediately got on the phone with our IRB office. And as I was saying, well, look, you know, these things usually take several weeks and, and immediately they cut me off and they say, we are meeting daily. Don't worry about it. Take 10 minutes, describe what you're trying to do to us. And we will draft the document. We will send it to you to make sure that it's okay because they're the experts. They see, I mean, you know, I, I may have written like 20 IRBs, but they've seen thousands. So they will know that, no, you don't tick that box here. You tick this other box. We're working on a computational or computerized way of doing it so that that will be clear to you. I know that's, a, don't have to worry about any of that. They did that for us. And so what was I free to do, not just me, but all the other people who I mentioned, we were free to do the stuff that we could do that they couldn't do, right? For putting out the call, it wasn't sort of, well, you know, send an email to your department's administrator and at the next hospital meeting, they will, no, it was literally me on the phone with the head lawyer for the institution, with the CEO of the institution, with the president of our hospital, saying this is the email that must go out to everyone, to the, the head of the Department of Medicine, as well as, of course, the Department of Pathology Chair who had my back the whole way. And I said, we need the following people to do the following things. And by the time I finished saying that, they said done and a copy of the email was appearing in my inbox. So Maya, to answer your question, how do you, or maybe an implication to your question, how do we get this kind of cooperation to happen when we don't have a crisis? There's these social norms, which I'll, I'll get back to in, in a second, but there's all of the administrators really taking care of the administration for us. Um, that was a huge lesson learned. So, I mean, don't, don't write Amazing. grants, have somebody write the grants for you. I mean, things, things of that kind, right? I mean, just like, tell us, oh, scientists, tell us what the science is and we'll take it from there. It really, really was sort of the proper use of what they call Ricardo's rule. Uh, misapplied in human development, but widely, uh, I think, applicable here, which is just, look, let the, let the person who knows the, the stuff best do that part of the job here. A word about social norms, uh, or another word about social norms. It is um, so many things in these kinds of group endeavors come down to just what is, what is the culture of what's okay? And you can see this like in life all the time, right? From dress codes to like the five minute rule, which is, uh, you know, I lived in Sweden for a while. Everybody was always on time for things. Nobody ever interrupted anybody when they were talking, right? It's just, it's just kind of the habit. You could say it's better, you could say it's worse, but in that culture, that is what is essentially required of appropriate social interaction, not everywhere. I spend a fair bit of time in New York, and if two people aren't talking at each other at the same time, something is considered wrong, right? And you know, nobody would say that New Yorkers can't get things done. Nobody would say that the Nordic countries don't know what they're doing, just different cultural norms. Um, some cultural norms work better for this kind of cooperative endeavor than others. And enforcing those norms, calling out cooperation, being the first to publicly and repeatedly mention I am not going to, uh, I am not going to uh, take credit for this global cooperative thing. I am not going to try to patent any of this stuff. I am going to make everything that I learn publicly available as soon as I learn it on this site for everybody. And you can see it. In fact, you can see as we go, a transcript of this statement that I am making appearing online in real time. I mean, essentially that kind of a thing. Because if you start with yourself, then it makes it a lot harder for other people to, to not do that. And I could imagine this goes back to like the tit for tat idea you were talking about earlier, where other people will follow what the person has done before. There, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that. There's also no tolerance for hypocrisy here. I mean, God knows, like most of what politics is, is talking a good game, but then doing something else. You have to say it and you have to do it. And if it's not happening for whatever reason, you've got to call it out. I said I would do this and I did not get this done. That's on me. 
because if you are doing that, especially if you are, you know, uh, you know, not not formally, but in this case, certainly perceived to be the boss, then people are like, whoa, that's the boss is saying that, you know, the boss is taking blame. Um, you know, the, the boss is giving up something meaningful to the boss. Well, I'm going to do that too, uh, because that's what we're doing here today, I guess. Right. So that kind of thing, social norms. And never let your head get too big about this stuff. So a, a, a short story, I can't remember what culture it is, but there is a culture, uh, I think a hunter-gatherer culture, where uh, they, they have the following, th this is, so hunter-gatherer culture, most of the hunting is done by the, uh, by the younger, uh, stronger, uh, larger males in the population, which you can imagine, like who, who can throw a spear best, I guess. And I'm obviously oversimplifying, but it's, it's sort of that kind of dynamic. And so in, in this culture, it is often the case, again, I can't remember the details, can't remember what kind of prey they go after, but it's more or less like a one or two person thing where they'll go out and trap some quadruped and bring it back for, for food. And when they come back, I'm, I'm, oh gosh, it's on the tip of my tongue. When they come back, when the hunter or hunters come back with this, this prize, which is going to feed all of the people of the tribe, which is going to make the difference between uh, survival and starvation for everybody, men, women, children, young and old, everybody sits in a circle and takes turns giving the hunters crap. Oh, is that all you were able to do? <laughs> uh, wow, did it die before you got to it? Huh, I didn't think you could actually get anything done. Whoa, do you, did you, are you sure that you did this and it wasn't somebody else? Then just <laughs> they'd give the hunters crap. And you might say, why are they giving the hunters crap? That's the hunter who's feeding them. But the reason why they do that, of course, is because it's too easy to give that person a big head. It's too easy to feed in to the narrative that that person is the provider, that that person is therefore the most important, that therefore that person is who matters in the tribe, and by implication, nobody else does. Whereas in fact, just because not everybody is out there capturing that, that, that meal, doesn't mean that everybody else isn't doing important things, right? Everybody's got to pull their weight. And so kind of the same thing uh, I think it's a, it's a valuable lesson to me uh, about cultural norms too, is that if you are perceived to be the leader, first of all, it takes it takes everybody, right? I don't for a second think that I did this, we did this. Take any one of the people or the roles out from from what I described, nothing. This wouldn't have happened. Like no no part of this would have happened. And great, I'm the MD, and it fell to me to start this process, and I am one of many. And so uh, I think it helps also if the quote unquote boss, the, the perceived leader, uh, you know, keeps that in mind that fine, that it may fall to them to lead, but leading is just part of what's going on. So, um, so I think establishing that social norm is something that, that anybody can do at any time. So I guess it's a combination of things, social norms, and uh, you know, people people doing what they're best at to free other people to do what they're best at. I don't think we needed the pandemic in order to do this, but I sure hope that we will learn those lessons and uh, apply them so that we can all get more done for ourselves. Because what a, I mean, you know, a terrible dark cloud the pandemic has been and continues to be. But what what a lovely silver lining to that that it at least taught us what we can get done in weeks if we just you know follow these you know pretty pretty simple pretty straightforward pretty well proven rules for success i think it is a great lesson and thank you so much for sharing your stories it gives i think all of us a lot of hope for the future and shows that you know these seemingly impossible things are really within our grasp well, thank you for for having me. I hope uh, this is as uh, entertaining and interesting for your listeners as it's been for me.